thanks so much, uh, Anton, and, and thank you for the rest of you for being here. I'm just always honored anytime somebody wants to attend something we teach. It's, it's a real privilege to be here. Um, real quick background, is, as Anton said, I, I, bet I was with Peacemaker Ministries for 30 years, and it started off actually as a ministry conceived by the Christian Legal Society, the idea of uh, Christian attorneys helping believers live out uh, the teaching in 1 Corinthians 6, where Paul says, instead of going into the civil courts to resolve disputes, Christians should seek first to go to the church and try to get wise people there to help them. So I was doing legal mediation arbitration and a lot of uh, training and teaching on conflict resolution skills for 30 years. And in 2012, after 30 years of putting out the fires of conflict, so to speak, I thought, you know, I'd really like to help people prevent the fires of conflict. How do we help it people where they don't even get close to a divorce or a church split or a lawsuit? And so that's when I stepped out from Peacemaker and launched a new ministry called Relational Wisdom 360 or RW360. And it's basically an enhanced form of emotional intelligence, taking wisdom principles from God's word, the gospel itself, and bringing in what we're learning through good neurological studies about the brain and emotions and how they affect our behavior and ultimately our relationships. And so we're now combining all of that peacemaking, relational wisdom, biblical mediation arbitration into a, an integrated training system. And we will handle everything from two neighbors with barking, a barking dog who are not getting along, uh, which was actually one of the hardest cases I've ever had because people were threatening to shoot each other. Um, all the way up to uh, major lawsuits, $200 million lawsuits. And I've seen the same basic fundamental principles apply across that spectrum. What I want to do today, though, is, at Anton's request, is focus in on a very specific thing that is really near and dear to my heart, is how do we share the gospel with other people? And because the gospel ultimately is the most powerful peacemaking uh, wisdom principle force the world's ever known. What I want to do right now, I'm going to share my screen. I want to bring up a PowerPoint. Uh, oh, I can't do this unless you make me a co-host. Can you make me a co-host, Anton? Yeah, let me try that. Now, I, I did load into the chat three links that I would encourage you to copy and later on download. One of those links, the first one is a link to a free online course on the RW Academy, an on, online a training place that is a extended version of the talk I'm giving today. It's a one hour seminar called Relation, Using Relational Wisdom for Witnessing. There's also a link there to a new pamphlet we just developed that is really a powerful tool for sharing the gospel. And then the third link is to a, an outline it's a presentation I recently gave to the Montana University of Montana School of Law, sort of their inaugural kickoff event in December. And I'm using it for continuing legal education for law firms and county and state bar association meetings. Would love to, if, if you all like some of this material, I'd love to talk with you how you could learn to teach it yourself or use our video recorded material and bring it into your, your CLS chapter. So be sure to look at those links. Um, talking about sharing Christ with courage and wisdom. I want to pose a uh, hypothetical to you. Imagine one of your classmates came up to you next week and said, I got to tell you something really neat. I just became a Christian. I just started to realize that, that God is there. He's real. He loves me so much that my sins separated me from him, that Jesus died for my sins. I've trusted him. I have new life. I'm so excited. And, and I want to share it with you. And you said, well, I'm already a Christian. And suddenly this look comes over your friend's face and said, you've known this for a long time? Why didn't you share this with me? If I had gotten in a car wreck and died without this, I would have gone to hell. Why didn't you share this with me? What would you say? I think most of us would have a real awkward moment right there. Why didn't we share it? And especially the person followed up, don't you care about me? Don't you love me? Why wouldn't you share this incredibly important news with me? And the fact is that many Christians just don't know how to share the gospel, and they would feel very embarrassed at a moment like that. So what I want to do today, very briefly, is give you some key steps that you can use to share the gospel 
friends, classmates, people in the law firm where you might in, intern in future employment settings with your extended family, whatever. These are, these are principles and skills you can lose, use in all those settings. And point number one, and there's a, there's a six page outline you can download from those links I gave you, but I'm just gonna hit a few of the high points because we just have limited time. Number one, it is all about relationship. It is all about relationship. Unless you have a spiritual gift and calling to be an evangelist. And there's people who go out there and they have big meetings and people come and they preach the gospel to people they never have a relationship with. And sometimes God leads people to Christ, like Billy Graham, for example. But for most of us, we're not going to just walk up to a stranger or someone we know just casually and just launch right into a gospel presentation. We have to earn the right to speak into their lives. We have to create a relationship that opens a door for them to feel comfortable talking to us about something that is so personal and, and so significant in people's lives. So building a relationship is so important. And let me illustrate this with you, um, with this story from my life. I was raised um, in a Christian home. My mom was a very devout Christian. My father was not a Christian until just an hour before he died. But I knew all the Christian theology, and I, I could have probably passed a basic exam on fundamental Christian theology, who is God, what's the gospel, etc. But I, I don't think I really made it a personal part of my life, truly trusted in Christ, until just before I went to law school. I can't point to a day where I know that is definitely the day that I became a Christian. It was There's this progression there. But I do know three people who played a key role in me coming to Christ and really committing my life to him. One was an office mate in um, uh, when I, I was a mechanical engineer before I became a uh, lawyer. And I had an office mate uh, at Exxon where I was doing a summer clerkship. And I just saw in him a quality of integrity, relational skills. I overheard him talking to his wife on the phone. And he just he was an incredibly relational guy. I just thought, man, that's kind of man I want to be someday. Uh, that's kind of marriage I'd like to have someday. It just really impacted me. Uh, then I had an office mate in uh, graduate school, and uh, we shared an office for a full year. And he, too, was just an incredibly gracious man, very wise, good counsel, good listener. His wife would come by the office sometimes with one of their little children. They would talk for a while. And I I just watched him with envy because I, I really wanted to be married, to have a marriage like that. And then I, after I graduated and I went to work in California for a while, again, a Christian office mate. God, God was really preparing me. Um, and this office mate, exactly the same scenario. Gracious, thoughtful, wise man, good listener, a uh, lot, of, lot of good advice on issues when I brought things to him. We be, really became good friends. And there again, his marriage was something that also was very, very winsome. And I finally, being an engineer, I look for common denominators. And I finally, as I thought about these three men whose lives I wanted so much to imitate, I realized the common denominator was, wasn't that they were all engineers, although they were, it was that they were all Christians, very committed Christians. And that is one of the things that really made me begin to seriously look at Christianity again, not as something my mother handed on, handed down, but something I wanted to have in my life. And uh, one of these, that last couple, the, the wife of that one engineer friend of mine, it was the one that really witnessed to me one day, shared the gospel in a very clear and powerful way. And it, it just shook me to my toes. And that was the night I went home. And I, I think if, as of that point, I think that's when I really understood um, I was a sinner. Jesus died for my sins. And by trusting him, I'd have salvation, new life. And that was just about three months before I went to law school. So the point I'm trying to make there is our relationships with other people are a huge part of what will lead other people and give us the opportunity to speak to people about Christ. And Jesus alludes to this in, in John 13, 34 through 35, a new commandment I give you that you love one another, just as I have loved you, so also are you to love one another. By this, all people will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. It's our relationships that give testimony to our relationship with God. People see something in us that is different, that is desirable. Uh, it's like walking into a mall where there's a Cinnabon and you, you smell that fragrance. Oh, there's a Cinnabon place around here. That smell is so wonderful. The Bible even talks about the fragrance of the gospel. 
And that fragrance should be the love in our relationships, um, not only with, in, for example, with our friendships and marriages at some point, but how we relate to other people, fellow classmates in law school. And so your relationships will have a huge impact on your capacity, your ability to sometimes be able to share the gospel. Um, the fields are absolutely wide under harvest. Just, you know, for the age range that most of you are probably at, be um, millennials between 25 and 40 years of age, there's 72 million millennials in the United States, 72 million. And the statistics show that an enormous portion of them do not know God. Um, but it's interesting, one of their strongest desires is to have better relationships. So that's that's a desire we can really tap into. They want better relationships. It's a very common, one of the highest desires of the millennial generation. Um, 126 million adults in the United States go to work every day. 28 million of them probably do not know God. Uh, are not affiliated with any religion. So the, the anywhere you go, you look around uh, to the right or to the left, you're probably standing near someone who does not know Jesus. And if they died 10 minutes later, would spend eternity separated from him instead of enjoying and worshiping him. So the need is, is absolutely incredible. And I, there's a lot more statistics and quotes in the outline, but I'm not going to go into those things. What we first of all want to encourage people to do is really upgrade your relational skills. Um, studies show that attorneys on average have a lower emotional intelligence than the average person. Attorneys have a lower emotional intelligence than the average person in the United States. And by emotional intelligence, I mean your capacity to read and manage your own emotions and to read the emotions of people around you and to respond to them in a constructive way. Attorneys typically are weaker in that skill area than the average person. Um, one of the documents I gave you has got a link to the article that, that uh, mentions some of those studies. So we really need to upgrade our skills. So two skill sets that I'd like to encourage you to seriously look at developing, and this could be a study in your CLS chapter. You could do this together. One of them is what we call emotional or relational wisdom, which is an enhanced form of emotional intelligence. And it's basically six skills. God awareness, God engagement, who is God, what is he like, how do I respond to him, self-awareness, self-engagement, what am I feeling, what am I thinking, what are my skills, gifts, dreams, strengths, weaknesses, and how do I discipline and control myself, and then other awareness, other engagement is how do I read other people, exercise empathy, compassion, serve them, minister to them, care for them in a way that is beneficial to them, and in some cases opens a door for sharing the gospel. Those are six skills you can learn and improve. There's basically after about 12, age of 12, 13, 14, your, your intelligence quotient IQ, your capacity, your ability to learn new information and apply it, that stays fairly flat from your early teenage years. There's not much you can do to improve your IQ, but you can improve your emotional intelligence, which is called EI or EQ, or this enhanced form, RW, substantially with practice. It's like playing the piano. It's like playing golf. It's like playing tennis. Practice will make you better at these skills. So we provide online training uh, that I'm happy to give you all access to for free uh, where you could enhance these skills. So as you interact with fellow classmates at law school every day or a roommate or a future spouse or Oh, goodness, when you get kids, you really need a lot of relational wisdom, especially when they reach the teen years. Uh, but these are skills you can improve. Um, and those six skills really are reduced down into basically an application or an uh, outpouring of the great commandment. When Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul and love your neighbor as you love yourself. So there's those three dimensions, God, self, and other. So really, relational wisdom is just living out the great commandment. The other skill set that we, we would love to help you develop, and this could be very valuable as attorneys, uh, is conflict resolution or peacemaking. And as Anton said at the beginning, I've got a, a book that was published 30 years ago. I think we've, we're over 500,000 copies now in uh, 20 languages. So it's really, it's really gained a lot of traction, never ceases to amaze me. But just basic 
principles of conflict resolution, we use those principles, those four basic principles, glorify God, get the log out of your own eye, gently restore, how do you confront and correct others in a constructive way, go and be reconciled, how do you negotiate agreements and, and really seek forgiveness and reconciliation. Those four basic peacemaking skills have been used to resolve just about every kind of conflict you can imagine. Multi-million dollar lawsuits, church splits, conflict, wrongful discharge, child sexual abuse, you name it, we've, we've seen those cases. That also is an online course at our academy that I would be happy to let uh, you have free access to as well. Um, so you could go through that either individually or in your CLS chapter, you could go through it as a chapter and talk about those principles. So those are some basic print, uh, resources. There's more information in the study guide on how to access those. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of resources, a lot of free downloads, smartphone apps, everything else. There's links to them. One resource in particular, I'll talk about a little bit more in the end. We just produced a new pamphlet called Transformed. And this is something that's very handy for sharing the gospel. And I'll explain in a few minutes how you can use this. But that's the outside cover and part of the inside. Um, so use as you develop those skills, your relational skills, your conflict resolution skills, you can start to use those skills to develop relationship or what we call passport with other people. Because witnessing is relational long before it's rational. Witnessing is relational long before it's rational. Before you start to impart knowledge and information about the gospel, you need a relationship. It's almost like that, that's the the telephone line that is connected where you can communicate to someone else and that their heart would be open to what you're saying is through your relationship. So these skills, there's a lot, a lot of ways you can use it. One of the skills we teach a lot in our conciliator mediation training is the idea of building passport. And anytime somebody is trying to decide whether they're going to allow you to speak into their lives, where they're going to share with you what we call the fine china of life, before they would allow you to really understand and have access to what's going on inside, you've got to have passport with them. And there's three questions people are subconsciously asking when they're trying to decide whether they would open up with you and share with you important personal information. Number one, can I trust you? Not only can I trust you to be confidential, absolutely important that you wouldn't you know, go around share uh, confidential information, but also, can they trust that you won't judge them or think less of them if they open up and share something really embarrassing in their life, some real struggle with sin, uh, some big mistakes they've made, some weaknesses, some fears? Do they have confidence that you will still care for them, respect them, look at them the same way, relate to them the same way, even if they bring out some of the garbage that they're wrestling with in their lives? Secondly, do you really care about me? Are you are you are you here talking to me because it's your job or it's an obligation or you can't figure out a way to walk away? Are you here because you care? You really care. And you communicate that in lots of different ways. Your time, your tone of voice, your facial expressions, your body language, even reaching over and just touching someone's arm at the right time in an appropriate way that, that can communicate an awful lot that you really care about somebody. I've had times where I met people in the coffee shop. And I was planning to head to the office for an executive staff meeting. And this person shared with me something that indicated some problems. And when I pull out my phone and call my secretary and say, Chris, I need to bump that uh, the VP meeting back to this afternoon. Something important's come up. And I close my phone. I've sent a message to that person. You know, I've met in the coffee shop that I care enough to bump a meeting so I can sit and talk to them about an issue in their lives. So lots of ways you communicate you really care about people. And then finally, can you actually help me? You, you might be trustworthy, you might be caring, but if you don't have wisdom and skills and knowledge on how to solve problems, relational, legal, financial, whatever it might be, people aren't gonna come to you. One of the things you gain as an attorney, you get a license and they, they assume that means you've got a certain set of skills and knowledge that you can use to help them. Well relational skills and knowledge or wisdom is also very, very important. And there's lots of ways you communicate that. I found in law school, when our CLS chapter started when I was in my freshman year, initially there was just two of us. And then we were, a classmate overheard us talking uh, in the stacks in the, in the library one day. And we were just something we were saying about studying the Bible together. And 
Laura said, I, are you Christians? And we said, yes. Is, are, are you are you meeting together? I said, yeah, we're getting together for lunch. Said, Could I join you? And, and that's, that's what happened over the next three years was just the relationships that people saw, other students saw us have with each other, conversations they were heard, how we interact with people, even in classroom discussions, um, respect, courtesy, seeking to understand, asking questions, uh, lots of ways, even in a classroom, you can communicate um, relational skills and attitudes that reinforce these things you need for passport. And then people began seeking us out. One, I remember one of our classmates was struggling tremendously uh, with bulimia. And she came to our group and just poured out in tears this huge struggle she was having in that area. But she had seen us caring for each other, supporting each other. And she finally said, you're the group. You're the group of people I trust I could come to. And uh, God worked with that group to help her tremendously, not only overcome that problem, but actually graduate from law school. So another skill set that is really important is just empathy and compassion. Um, this is a skill you can learn and you can grow in. Uh, there's a free download called Seven Steps to Empathy. Uh, it's The link is in the outline you can get. And it's just some very deliberate ways how to ask questions, use imagination, uh, pray for people, respond. Uh, show compassion, how do you model compassion, communicate compassion, etc. cetera. Um, there's a companion study of this, by the way, for any of you who have children, that you can start cultivating and raising um, empathetic children. And this is a skill you can start at a very young age, 18 months, two years of age, children have a capacity for showing empathy for other people. Um, so then the other thing that comes up a lot in law school, of course, is just controversial issues, um, gender issues, political issues. The next several months are going to just be very volatile. And how we respond to those things and engage in those things could send a big message to other people. Uh, what we what we do? Are, are we just a right wing, right wing extremist Christian fundamentalist? Or are we reasonable? Do we ask questions? Do we seek to understand? Do we acknowledge validity? Do we find common ground with other people? There's a lot of common ground we can have with other people, that people should be respected, should be not discriminated against, et cetera. So there's a lot of relational skills we can use to build relationships, even with people who might be very, the other end of the spectrum on some of these cultural and political issues. Looking for opportunities to use peacemaking is a hyperlink to the gospel. I always looking for that. I, I pray every morning, God, if there's some way you could use my interactions today that I could share the gospel with someone, please show me what they are. And just as an example, Let's imagine you're in school, you're in a class, there's discussion, someone is just downright rude and mean. I mean, just says something is just an absolute dig and their conscience is bothering them. And afterwards, you know, she approaches you in the hallway and say, hey, sorry for what I said. I, I, I didn't really mean to, to do that. I'm sorry. And, you know, just maybe it's a very pathetic confession. But if it's a teeny, tiny little admission that someone realized what they did is wrong. It's a golden opportunity to latch on to it and to forgive them and tell them what you mean by forgiveness. And these are the four promises we teach in our peacemaking course. And you can say to this person, say, hey, Susan, I, I understand. I, you know, I didn't take it personally. And I want you to know I forgive you for that. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I mean, I am not going to dwell on this or brood over it. I'm not going to ever throw this back in your face. I'm not going to talk to other people about this, and I'm not going to let it stand between us and hinder our personal relationship. And that person might just sort of look at you like, wow, I've never heard it. Where did you learn that? I said, well, I'm a Christian. Those, those are the promises God made to me when I trusted in Jesus Christ as my Savior. So you've taken a human offense, a meager little admission of wrong, model human forgiveness, and then eventually pointed them up to God and the gospel of Christ. So there's all sorts of opportunities come up in daily life for us to model these things to other people. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. Romans 12 is one of the most powerful peacemaking and relationship building tools there is. And that is if somebody has done you wrong, find a way to do something nice for that person. It's a powerful way. As, as Romans 12 says, in doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. You'll bring conviction. Often God will use that to make that person feel guilty. You come back and say, how could you be so nice to me after what I did to you? And again, there's a segue to the gospel. So, well, that's, that's what God does for me every day. I stumble and fail. I am struggle with sin and pride and laziness, you name it. 
And yet God is so gracious, so kind because of his son, Jesus. And they go, wow, where'd you learn that? How'd you, how'd you know that? I say, hey, let's get together for lunch. I'd like to talk to you some more. Join our CLS chapter. We talk about these things all the time. So if you find even ways to do something kind for someone who knows they don't deserve it, that's a powerful way as well. Um, practicing conversational coaching. Someone, as they start seeing you as being a gracious, thoughtful, kind, wise person, they might start staring some issues in their life. Oh, my, my office mate is a jerk, or the guy I'm living with is this, or so-and-so, and, and just talking to people, and instead of just going right into giving them advice, what we teach through our coaching courses is how can you, instead of just telling someone what to do, how can you help them discover the right answer themselves? And that's usually done with really thoughtful questions. Well, tell me more about the situation. Has this been a pattern? How do you feel when that happens? Has he done this to other people? And you basically ask questions to help that person understand more clearly their situation, and then you say, well, what are some of your options? Well, I could leave him. I could just ignore it. I could do this. I could do this and say, well, which one of those do you think would be the most effective at this point? And you just, with careful questions, help that person arrive at what they think at the moment would be the best solution, develop a plan to implement it. And then a week later, you say, well, how'd it go? What happened when you went back there? And I didn't work very well. Okay, well, is there another way that might be better? And you take them through a new path until they come back and say, oh, that really helped. Thanks so much. I'm so grateful for you helping me to do that. So those are, you know, conversation, practicing hospitality, inviting people into your home. Meals can be incredibly important. Um, it was a big part of my spiritual growth of just people at church inviting me into their homes, inviting people. You could lead a group study, offer a group study uh, in your law school on some of these principles. We have both faith-based studies on relational wisdom and and, and secular values-based. And so you could actually invite other law students who do not profess to be Christians to do a study in our values-based secular material that gets into emotional intelligence, a lot of the neurological things, but it opens a door to talk about worldviews, pros and cons of different faith approaches. It's a very easy way to start bringing your faith into the picture. And of course, inviting other people to your church is, is sometimes really a, a significant way. Um, in the outline, we, we talk a lot about how to prepare your testimony. Uh, some of you may have seen the, um, the recent uh, uh, video television series, The Chosen. One of my, it's a, it's a life of Christ and the early apostles. One of my favorite lines in there is where um, uh, Nicodemus sees Mary Magdalene after she's been uh, delivered of all the demons. And he's amazed at the change in her life. And he asks her what's going, what happened? And her answer was so beautiful. She said, I was once one way and now I'm completely different. What happened in between was him. That's about the simplest, be most beautiful testimony I can imagine. And then you can actually develop a more thoughtful, more detailed testimony and be prepared for it. It's like you wouldn't go into uh, uh, you know, a, a appeal to the Supreme Court unless you'd really thought through your arguments, the logic of the arguments, the transition, anticipating objections, et cetera. Well, what's more important than sharing your testimony, the word of life with people? So there's, a, there's quite a bit of guidance in our, our full course on how you can prepare your testimony um, in, a, in a way that you're comfortable and concise and can share it very easily with other people. Um, you can learn relational skills, questions, other awareness, other engagement to draw people out, learn their story, and then connect something in your life that connects with theirs so they know you can really relate to what they're doing. And then when you're ready to share the gospel, some, someone may just say, what do I do? How do I pray? Be prepared to actually lead them through a prayer that would be where they acknowledge their recognition, they're sinners, they need God's forgiveness, they're trusting in Jesus. So I, this is just a sample prayer. Uh, I led my father through that prayer an hour before he died. And uh, it was so incredible to see the look on his face, the peace that came over him that last hour. And I know that when I see him someday, he'll be in heaven. And that's a great encouragement. Back to this pamphlet, one of the... Um, links I gave you in the uh, chat box is a, to this, this pamphlet. You can, you can purchase these uh, through our bookstore. And it's just a real simple pamphlet that talks, it's a very clear, simple gospel presentation. And then on the inside, there's this chart that just shows the transforming power of the gospel, how our 
behavior or relational skills are dramatically changed. So it gives 12 different life situations. And, and then it says, apart from the gospel, I respond this way, but being transformed by the gospel, I, I respond this way. So on the one hand, as you read that, I hope it would actually convict you a bit and say, whoa, there's some areas I still need some transformation because I'm still stuck with some of these old worldly habits and God is, is calling me and offering me strength to change. So number one, it's something that could challenge Christians to continue in their spiritual growth. But number two, it's an excellent way to share the gospel with people and actually illustrate in very practical ways what would happen, how their life would change if they embrace Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And one of the ways that we encourage people to use this, I don't know what your law school situation is, but we had uh, cubicles in my law school in the library, um, and we can leave our books there and things like that. And I encourage um, people in the workplace or in the law school, just have one of these pamphlets and just put it on your, um, on your cubicle, your desk, or wherever you are, just leave it there. It's a fairly striking uh, cover on the pamphlet. And then just pray, God, cause someone to come by and see that and just be curious. And so someone comes by and they're chatting with you. They look at the pamphlet and they say, well, what's that all about? You say, oh, that describes the power that completely changed my life. You, you can take it if you want. And they go, oh, okay. And they pick it up and walk away. They are walking away with the word of life. They're walking away with the gospel in their hands. And they may go, and then you need to just pray, God, as that person reads this thing, they may go back to their cubicle, open it up, start reading it. Just say, oh, God, please, through your Holy Spirit, open this person up, uh, regenerate this person, bring them from death into life. And then you pull another pamphlet out and put it back on your desk and pray for the next curious person. And so we've got people now that are just keeping several of these at, in, like in their office, and they just put one on the desk two or three times a day. Employees come by or coworkers and walk away with the gospel. That's about one of the safest ways you could ever witness to somebody is just let them walk away with that. So in conclusion, the, the three key steps, pray, 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 relationship, 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 and prepare, prepare, prepare.